Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Conrad. Uh, as she mentioned, I will be presenting on emotional modulation of pain. Just some disclosures. I have no commercial relationships to disclose. It will not discuss any off-label use of medications. Actually, I will not discuss any use of medication, so we don't have to worry about that. Just a little bit of information about me before we get started. So I grew up in Mexico in a little town uh, south of San Diego. So it's about an hour south of San Diego. So it's pretty small and I lived there and got my education up until high school. After that, I went to San Diego State University among other uh, community colleges and graduated there with a degree in psychology in uh, 2013. After that, I moved to Oklahoma and attended the University of Tulsa uh, in order to get my degree in uh, my PhD in clinical psychology. And it's there where my um, pain research career started since I'm, uh, I'm also a pain researcher or pain researcher in training. Uh, there I worked in Dr. Jamie Rudy's lab and uh, his lab is uh, an effective neuroscience lab. So I learned a lot of the bulk of the information that I'm gonna present to you here in that laboratory, which I spent a little bit of time at. Then uh, for my internship, I went to the University of Mississippi Medical Center and graduated with my PhD in clinical psychology in uh, 2020. So just last year, I got my PhD. So a big milestone there. Now I'm a clinical and research pain fellow here at Stanford and ready to give you some information. So the objectives for the talk or the, the topics that I'm going to cover, it's gonna be emotions, pain, nociception, and the relationship between emotions and pain. So I will cover both pain and nociception. They are not the same thing, they are different and it is an important difference. And I will go into it a little bit you know, afterwards, in a little bit. Let's start off with emotions. So the formal definition of emotions, there's several, you know, there's, there's probably several around, but this is the de definition provided by the American Psychological Association. So it reads, uh, a complex reaction pattern involving experiential, behavioral, and physiological elements by which an individual attempts to deal with a personally significant matter or event. So this is a, a, a mouthful. There's a lot going on here. So I'm gonna try and dissect this for you and give you some information about we, you know, as providers, psychologists, medical professionals, think about emotions and not in a more colloquial way as um, people might, which might just talk about emotions. They might just mean the feeling state, the experiential component that I'll talk about in a little bit. So first off, let's go into the elements of the emotion. So there's an experiential component, a behavioral component, a physiological component. The experiential component is the feeling state, right? That um, element or that thing that you talk about with somebody else um, kind of in a colloquial way, like I, I feel angry. You're typically talking about kind of that feeling state of anger or, or I'm sad. You're usually talking about that sensation of emptiness, you know, that feeling state. The physiological elements are basically the changes in your body, right? The, the increase, for example, the increase in blood pressure or the decrease in blood pressure, the increase in heart rate, the increase in muscle tension, the increase in respiration, all these, the increase in you know, sweating or you know, the decrease in all of those. 
that's what we um, that's what the physiological element of emotions is. The behavioral part, that is what emotions kind of prep you to do, right? In certain, in a lot of these emotions, they prep you to do something, right? In disgust, for example, they prep you to move away from something. In anger, it preps you to move towards something. Happiness, you know, you can skip, you know, it preps you to feel light and, and do certain things that make you seem happy. These emotions, uh, certain emotions classically also have uh, facial expressions tied to them. And that is also part of the behavioral component. So now let's go a little bit on to the other part. The other part that I uh, um, kind of, um, I uh, underlined the reaction. So, in emotions, an emotion is a reaction to something, right? An emotion um, actually is in response to something. So something triggers an emotion. This, this could be a lot of different things. This, this could be something environmental. Uh, for example, somebody yelling at you. It could be something internal, like a thought. And a thought, you know, we deal a lot uh, with this in psychology, they elicit emotions, right? So thinking about it in a timeline, there's a triggering event, right? Something produces an emotion. Then you experience that emotion and that's the experiential part of it and the physiological part of it. And then there's the response. That is the behavioral part of it. So I'm talking a little bit abstract. So let's ground it down into uh, into an example. Um, let me, okay, so this is kind of the timeline, right? You have a triggering event, you have an experience, you know, you experience the, the, the emotion that's in the blue, and then you have a response. In this case, you would be ashamed, right? So the triggering event, a friend gets angry with you. Again, the experience, you feel sadness, and the response of the behavioral component is that you'd be ashamed. So that's kind of the timeline, but let's dig a little bit more into it because it seems this is a little bit oversimplified. We have to break down a little bit about the emotion uh, components to it and put everything into context. Because if we go a little bit with this example, there's a lot of emotions that you could feel when a friend gets angry at you, right? Why would you just feel sadness? Well, this is why. So if we break down the context of the trigger, it gives you a better idea of what emotion is eliciting. So it could be that you were listening to sad music and then a friend you know, gets angry at you and then it reminds you of a rejection that you had in the past. So it seems natural that you would have, that you would feel this sadness. So what is the sadness again? It is experiential and is the physiological part of it. So the experiential part of it is here at the bottom is that you feel empty, right? It's part of it, right? It's not, it's not all of it. But there's also the physiological part of it that an example of that would be that your body weakens. There's also many more um, physiological changes, right? You know, it could be decreased heart rate. It could be decreased blood pressure. It could be all these other responses. These are just a few. And then you have your reaction, which is being ashamed. Being ashamed is only one of the reactions though. There could be many more. So for example, you could actually call a loved one in order to, um, you know, get rid of the sadness. You could ignore the feeling and then continue on throughout the day. So this is kind of the idea that, yes, you have the emotion, but there's also different ways that you can react to that emotion or the emotion behavior that comes out of it, right? You could be ashamed, you could, ignore the feeling, or you could call a loved one. 
that's key there, right? Because in, in a sense, the emotion does lend itself for you to do certain things, but there's options within that range. So now we talked about sadness. Let's bring in another example. Because like I said in the, a little bit ago, that if a friend gets angry at you, right, it could elicit several emotions. Well, let's say this time it elicits happiness or enjoyment, right? Why would it elicit happiness if a friend is angry at you? Well, in this case, you actually scored a touchdown. So this is actually within the context of a game, right? It's not life or death. It's a simple game. And your friend is now looking like a sore loser. So now you, you feel righteous, right? You feel enjoyment. You feel the experiential part of it would be the righteousness among other things. Um, but then also the physiological components would be that adrenaline rush. And the behavioral part of this emotion, it could be that you gloat, could be that you play on, or it could be that you celebrate, right? You have options of what to do after these emotions are elicited. Another example, again, your friend gets angry at you and now you feel angry. Why do you feel angry? Well, you were low on sleep. And this reminds you of the old bully that you were dealing with back in the day. So now you're angry. You know, the context of your friend getting angry at you, you know, displays or lends itself to a certain emotion, anger in this case. What do you feel? You feel attacked, experiential part. And kind of the physiological part is that you become tense. Your muscles become tense. Your body becomes tense. Behavioral component to it. You argue. You could argue. You could avoid them or you could take a time out. So there's options here. So now that I kind of introduced a little bit about these emotions, right, that they function in a timeline, they're a little bit more complicated than we typically talk about emotion. Let's talk about how many they are. The answer to that is we don't know. As researchers, as emotion researchers, um, we don't know. But right, we've spent a lot of time researching emotions. But emotion researchers can argue, sorry, can agree that they are universal emotions. What that means is that there's emotions that are independent of culture, right? Anybody can have them. And that there are at least five. So, and here they are presented to you. These emotions have specific reactions, specific, specific triggers, and they lend themselves to specific behaviors and they have specific facial expressions. So these five emotions in the emotions research world have a little bit of a history, right? So the person that first, or among the people that first was looking at to facial expression and emotions was Dr. Paul Enkman. He, uh, I believe he was at UCSF. And he, di he discovered, well, categorized, I'd better say, six emotions instead of the five by facial expressions. He wanted to see, you know, uh, kind of linking certain feelings and behaviors with specific uh, facial expressions. He did all of these, right? He got enjoyment, disgust, anger, fear, and sadness, but he also added surprise. That didn't seem to survive the test of time. And emotions researchers, agree that it's these, at least these five. Let's go through these emotions. Enjoyment, where does it come from? Well, it describes the many good feelings that arise from experiences both novel and familiar. It, you know, enjoyment happens after success, after achieving a goal. It's a very lighthearted and happy emotion. The facial expression that comes along with it is the you know, the, the typical smile and the, the kind of the, the pulling of the eyes. I'm not sure how to describe it, but it's those two components. It's like smiling with the eyes, some people call it. So sometimes people can tell if you're 
if it's a socially uh, appropriate smile instead of a quote unquote true smile because of the eyes. Disgust. This emotion is, um, it basically tries to move you away from toxic things, things that are putrid, things that'll make you ill. For example, a you know rotten fruit, rotten food, anything like that. People will feel disgust and there's kind of this aversiveness and this need to move away from that thing that's producing the disgust, which is pretty behaviorally adaptive, evolutionarily adaptive because you don't eat you know, this thing is gonna you know, make you sick. The facial expression that goes along with this is the flaring of the nose, it's key. And then, you know, the, the showing of the teeth a little bit and the closing of the eyes. But the flaring of the nostrils is key. And some people think that the nostrils flare because your body wants you to get a really good whiff of that thing that, they, that your body doesn't want you to consume. It's basically making you even more disgusted by opening the nostrils so you can get a good whiff of that. Anger, the next emotion. Um, you know, when there's a, a, a obstacle obstruction, sorry, not an obstacle, a goal obstruction. So when you're trying to accomplish a goal and it's obstructed or you feel like you're treated unfairly, that produces anger. Anger has the sensation of moving forward towards something, right? When you're angry, you kind of move towards something that you want to kind of break down. Uh, the facial expression that goes along with it is kind of the flaring of the teeth and the whitening of the eyes. Fear is when you feel not safe or you feel threatened, right? Again, the, the, the facial expression with that, flaring of the eyes, opening of the mouth. Sadness is when you experience a loss and it shows you that you need social support. What comes, uh, the facial expression that comes along with it is the uh, frowning, right? The frowning of the face. So that's some information on emotions. Kind of to summarize this, um, emotion, emotions have several different elements to it. They have experiential behavior and physiological elements. Emotions are elicited by a trigger. You know, they function on a timeline. Okay? Something provokes it. Then you have the experience, which would be the experiential physiological elements. Then you have a response, which would be, you know, the behavioral component to it. Right now, we know there are at least five universal emotions, enjoyment, sadness, anger, disgust, and fear. So, who knows, there might be many more, but we still gotta do some research on that. Now let's take a little bit of a, a, a left turn. Let's talk about pain and how it relates to emotions. So pain, let's start with a definition, brand new definition brought to you by IASP. So the definition was recently changed. Um, it's it was changed to, to represent more of the subjective nature of pain, right? Pain is a person. And let's read the definition. And again, it's complicated, but I'll tr we'll try to dissect it so you can have a better understanding of what pain is. So pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. So, you know, let's go through the first line. An unpleasant, you know, unpleasant, aversive, you know, doesn't feel good. Sensory and emotional experience. All right. So it has two parts to it. The sensory part and the emotional part. The sensory part includes things like the location of the pain and the quality of the pain, right? The location of the pain is where it is. But it's not just where it is, it's where it starts and where it stops. What I mean by that is that your body, well, I'll give you an example, it's better that way. So if you have a needle and you prick your hand, you will know, even if you have your eyes closed and don't look at it, you will know where you're feeling that pain, right? You will know that if you prick your thumb, that it's on your thumb and it's not your index or your pinky or any other fingers or the palm of your hand. 
you will know where it is. You'll know that locations, you know, if you prick the top, you'll know that it's not on the bottom of your stomach. But if you have a stomach ache, right, you don't know exactly where it is. The pain is very diffuse. It's, you just know that you have this kind of aching sensation in your stomach. You don't really know where it is. It's just kind of all over the place a little bit. So that's kind of the, one of the sensory qualities of pain. The quality of the pain, right? What does it feel like? Pain can feel like different things. Pain is not just pain. There's burning sensations. There's stinging sensations. There's all sorts of other sensations. Interestingly enough, burning and stinging and prick, well, burning, let's keep it to two. Burning and stinging can actually show you what different neural paths are being um, taken. I guess I'll, I'll use the word taken, right? So certain, you know, I don't, want, I don't want to go too into it, but it's like certain fibers are related to certain quality of pain. So that's kind of the sensory part of it. It's, it's complicated, right? It's a, this definition is very packed. The emotional component of pain, right? We talked about emotions, physiological, experiential, and behavioral components. So the physiological components are many, but they increase, increase things, include things sorry, like increased heart rate, increased breathing, increased sweating, all these different things are related to pain. The experiential part of it, you know, the unpleasantness of it, the behavioral part of it, the guarding, right? You try to protect if you have acute pain, right? If you have an, a, an acute, uh, let's say a cut, you guard it, right? You protect it. You don't dig into it. You don't play around with it. You try to guard it. If it's chronic pain, you know, I mean, that could be beneficial if you're, if you have acute pain, if you have chronic pain, it's a little bit more uh, controversial. So experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage, right? So it is these sensory and emotional experiences associated with real potential tissue damage or resembling that. So it doesn't have to be with actual potential tissue damage. It could just resemble that. So people, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to mean that you need a wound to have pain. And there are certain conditions out there where you have pain, but it's not due to tissue damage, right? Okay, so we went through that. Now let's go through nociception. What is nociception and how is it different than pain? Well, nociception is a neural process of encoding a noxious stimuli. What is noxious stimuli? A potentially harmful stimuli. You know, something that's potentially harmful. So it's the neural process of encoding it and transmission, transmis, transmitting it, sorry. Um, so I, I have a little graph to show you the difference between nociception and pain and to, to exemplify a little bit. So I here have a figure of a person, right? This person is going to have, um, you know, some very strong stimuli on the finger. And then the signal will be transmitted to the spinal cord and up to the brain. That is nociception. You know, the encoding of the signal um, to the spinal cord and up to the brain. And then it's process in the brain, right? That's still not deception, but the interpretation of that signal, the subjective interpretation of that signal, that's pain. So that's the difference between pain and non-deception. It's an important distinction. Now, let's talk a little bit about chronic pain. So chronic pain is, the definition is still having pain three months, and sometimes it differs between three months and six months, after a wound is healed, you know, you still have pain. We have about 100 million adults in the United States that have chronic pain conditions. Redwood City has about 100,000 adults or people. Uh, I have a, you know, a nice picture of Redwood City right there. Uh, but, you know, uh, so that means that the population of people with chronic pain equals 1,000 times the population of Redwood City. So 1,000 Redwood cities are filled with people with chronic pain. So that's a lot, that's a lot. That's why we have to understand and prevent the development of pain. And uh, that's where we come in. 
let me tell you a little bit more about chronic pain. What's going on? So in chronic pain, in very simplified terms, oversimplified, right? This is just, you know, to give you some information on it. Something that's going on is that your pain system, the volume of your pain system is turned up. So everything feels either more painful or things that weren't painful, now they feel painful. So let me guide you to, um, hopefully I have a marker. Well, so the y-axis is pain intensity, right? So it would be just, you know, zero, no pain, one is a little bit of pain, up until pain, up until 10, which is the most intense pain sensation imaginable. What we have here is on the x-axis is, um, oh, jumped ahead a little bit, is actually stimulation intensity. Or in this case, let's just use pressure. Low stimulation intensity is just low pressure. So something like a caress. High stimulation intensity, in this case, just high pressure. So bone crushing pressure. Bone, literally bone crushing pressure, your bones are crushed. So as you move up a little bit on the, on the pressure, right, you start feeling pain. In the middle, you know, you could say it's something like stubbing your toe, right? And then goes up to bone crushing pressure. For people with chronic pain, this whole response curve oh, moves down. We call that sensitization. And then we have different names for, you know, if pain feels, if you used something that made you have pain but now feels more painful, we call that hyperalgesia. So if you if you stubbed your toe and if you had like a normal pain response, it was a two or a three. But now if you stub your toe and you had your sensitized, it could be an eight. That is hyperalgesia. And then the other term we use a lot is allodynia. That is having pain, feeling pain where you didn't feel pain before. For example, uh, caressing, right? Uh, just kind of light pressure on the skin. It didn't used to feel painful, now it feels painful. This is very common in skin burns, no, not skin burns, but sunburns, right? Pretty, very, very common example of this. Uh, it could be after shaving sensitivity, you know, sometimes you feel it, sometimes you don't. Uh, but there's many examples. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now a little bit more about how pain works. Uh, there's two main pathways that contribute to the perception of pain. The ascending pathway, which sends signals from the spinal cord up to the brain. So here you have a little bit, this figure has a little bit of pain in the back. Information will travel from the spinal cord up to the brain where the signal may be ultimately interpreted as pain, a five. Then we have the descending pathway where the information is, travels from the brain, sends signal down to the spinal cord where it can facilitate or inhibit incoming nociceptive signals. So it makes your pain less or more. So for example, the signal sent down to your spinal cord and it can make your pain less or more. This is one of the pathways that mood or emotions can change your pain, right? It can make you feel more pain or less pain. So how do I know this? How do we as scientists know that eliciting different emotions can change your pain? Well, this is, this is one of the ways that we did it. So I told you that I mentioned that I used to, um, that I used to work at uh, the University of Tulsa. Uh, in Dr. Jamie Rudy's laboratory, right? Excellent laboratory, it does great research. This is one of the, the, the experiments that we use. This is one of the, 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 the procedures that we use, or you know, part of the experiment. What we do is we have people sit down and they have, they're in front of a screen. And then the screen, we start showing them pictures, right? We have like control pictures. And then we show them pictures of uh, things that will elicit, it, elicit uh, a very big emotional reaction. So things that will make him uncomfortable, you know, and things that will make him very happy. Here's an example of the pictures. These are not necessarily the pictures that we use, it's just an example. So, and then, sorry, during the pictures, you get 
um, electrical stimulations, and then you rate the pain. So we want to see changes, right, between these pain ratings while you're watching different pictures. So, for example, here you have another control, zero. Here you have a picture that is supposed to elicit a negative emotion, right? An emotion that's unpleasant, right? In this case, it might be something like fear. And then you have an electrical stimulations. You make your rating. We move on. Here you have something that we would use as kind of a normal response or control, just everyday picture. Here we have nothing. We still give you a stimulation just to get that control for the reaction time and the, the uh, inter-picture interval. Here we have a picture that's supposed to make you feel happy. We, you know, elicit, uh, we give an electrical stimulation. You rate your pain. Here we have, you know, kind of in the middle two pictures. Then we have a regular picture. And then we give another stimulation. Throughout all these, after each stimulation, you rate your pain. So I was, so these, um, this, this experiment is supposed to, you know, show that uh, there's differences in pain. So, so I was actually on both sides of this experiment. I, I, I was the experimenter and the experimentee. I don't remember how many times I went through this experiment as the experimentee, because people have to practice before we bring on actual, you know, participants. So I know this experiment very well. Okay, so the results right here in the gray shows you the pictures that are supposed to elicit a bad emotion, right? A negative emotion. So that would be, we actually use pictures of mutilated um, body parts or faces or things like that uh, to elicit a strong negative emotion. We have neutral pictures like baskets, forks, the ones you just saw in erotica in order to elicit positive emotion. So as you can see, the pictures of the mutilation produce more pain and that's in the gray. In the pictures, uh, the erotica, which is in the, in the black, produce less pain. Right? We did not change how the simulation intensity, we didn't change how much electricity they got. Like we didn't change that. It's just the pure emotion that's modulating pain. So this is one of the reasons why we know 100% that emotions change pain, right? It's, it can't be anything else. So what's going on here? So this is kind of the information. Let's say you you know you see that negative picture. The your brain sends uh, signals down to the spinal cord, right? You get a painful sensation. It's sent to the spinal cord. It's amplified, right? It's amplified at the spinal cord. All right. What happens with the other pictures? Pictures are supposed to make you feel happy. All right. The signal sent down to the spinal cord. You have pain, right? It gets to the spinal cord, but then it's inhibited, right? It's inhibited. You don't, you feel a lot less pain. It's like, did something hurt me? You know, it's, it's, a, it's pretty interesting. Okay. So now it's going to get a little bit more complicated. So remember I told you that uh, positive emotions make you feel less pain. And that's completely true all around, right? Negative emotions, on the other hand, they go up. And then at one point, when the emotion is intense, like, like life-threatening intense, like you feel like you're in a life-threatening situation, it goes down and you feel less pain. Let me show you this. So here on this graph, the blue, the blue squares on the bottom, uh, they're showing reduced pain, right? The red squares on the top shows it creates pain. There's two um, arrows. One has positive balance emotion, so emotions that make you feel good. The other one has negative balance emotions, emotions that make you feel bad. And as you move to the right, the, em the intensity of the emotion increases, right? So a low emotion would be something like very lightly relaxed. High emotion would be ecstasy on the positive side, on the kind of negative emotion side, low emotion would be something like slightly frustrated, you know, irked. And then the intensity would be fearing for your life. And we see this in um, like people that have uh, been shot, been stabbed. 
war veterans, you know, people don't know that they've been injured, you know, in combat until afterwards somebody has to point it out. So that's, that's kind of um, the trajectory, the, the intensity of these negative emotions has with pain. Now you might be asking yourself, why? Why will your body do this, right? Because this is biologically programmed. This is something that's in people, right? Why would your body do this? Well, if you think about it a little bit, it kind of makes sense. For example, let me give you an example. Let's say you're out in the woods, right? In somewhere where you don't know, right? You don't know this area. You think it might be safe, but you're not entirely sure. And for some reason, you're walking during the night, right? So your body is kind of on guard, right? You are not sure what's going on. You know, you're hearing creaks, you're hearing cracks. You don't know if you're in danger, if you're safe. You're kind of anxious. So in that situation, it's actually a lot better for you, for your survival, to have an increase in pain because it could function as an alarm, right? If you have a little bit of pain, that could signal that you're in danger and it's now it's time to leave or now it's time to fight. So you want that signal to be loud. You want to hear that signal. But when you get to time, when it gets to the time where we actually have to run or when you have to fight, now it's time for you to feel no pain at all because you got to get it done. You got to get out of there, right? What if you do encounter something like a tiger? If you're running away, you don't want to feel anything, right? You don't want to feel the brushes in your face while you're trying to get away. You don't want to feel the scrapes that are, you know, as you're running through the bushes. It, you don't want to feel anything. You just want to get out of there as quickly as possible. And God forbid that you actually have to fight the tiger. Then you definitely don't want to feel anything. You just want to beat the tiger, you know, fight it successfully, and then survive. So that's kind of the interesting relationship between negative emotions and pain and positive emotions and pain. But so a little bit of kind of a summary. We know that pain is an unpleasant sensory emotional experience. You know, we talked about the sensory components of it, the location, the um, quality of it. We talked about the emotional components of, to it. We talked a lot about emotions. Nociception is actually the neural process of encoding and transmitting this information. Pain is the percept, the interpretation of the signal. There's differences. We know that there's two main pathways to contribute to the perception of pain. You have the ascending pathway and you have the descending pathway. So the ascending pathway, you know, is a transmission of information up to your brain. The descending pathway is your brain sending signals down to your spinal cord where it can make pain more or make pain less. So facilitate or inhibit incoming nociceptive signals. Positive emotions decrease pain all around. The higher the intensity of the positive emotion, the more pain inhibition that you will get. Negative emotions, a little bit trickier. You know, they mainly uh, increase pain. They mainly increase pain, right? Everyday activities, you know, being irked and being anxious, they would increase pain, except if you have a very intense negative emotions, life-threatening, right? Very, very intense. Then pain is decreased, right? Very, very interesting. Very interesting stuff. So what can you do? Now knowing this information, what can you do? How can you have, uh, play around with your pain a little bit more? Well, remember how we talked about the triggers of emotions, right? It could be something on the outside or it could, or it could be something on the inside. It could be something like your thoughts. Your thoughts can produce emotions, right? And here are some examples of we as psychologists call maladaptive thought patterns, thought patterns that are not useful to you. And they can produce in certain situations, pretty negative emotions, right? You can get frustrated, sad, angry, all these things that increase your pain. Some examples of these 
are all or nothing thinking, right? Black and white. Everything is black and white. You know, there's no gray ever. That might get you into some trouble. Overgeneralization. Nothing good ever happens. Is that true? Probably not. You know, you're just overgeneralizing. Filtering the positive, you know, disqualifying the positive, right? This doesn't matter. I mean, I, I'm worthless and it doesn't matter that I, you know, I completed all my homework and got everything. I got a B, I should have gotten an A, kind of disqualifying the positive. Jumping to conclusion, you know, kind of reading people's minds, deciding why they did something when they didn't have a say in it. Like, that, that's the reading people's mind, deciding why they did what they did when they in reality would have a completely different reason for doing what they did. Uh, predicting the future, you know, magnification and minimizing, again, blowing things out of proportion. So these are the type of strategies that you can use if you're having trouble with these thought patterns. Sorry, these are the thought patterns that you could um, see if you could change to you know, have a healthier relationship with your thoughts. Psychologists have extensive training in trying to help you with this. So if you see they're having problems with this, you can go see a psychologist. If you're having thoughts related to your pain, also they're maladaptive, be preferable if you see a pain psychologist like us. Something else that you can do, relaxation. So we talked about how kind of positive emotions inhibit pain. Well, there's a, there's a few ways that you can use that, right? You can produce the relaxation itself. One way that you can do that is through deep breathing. Another way that you can do that is through progressive muscle relaxation. Right, deep breathing, kind of have a nice, slow rhythm of breath. And I, regretfully, I can't go through an actual uh, deep breathing protocol. And progressive muscle relaxation is also a way that you can relax where you actually uh, tense your muscles and then relax your muscles. You could also use biofeedback, biofeedback, um, also helps you uh, manage your central nervous system so you're not too relaxed or too stressed. You get into that nice sweet spot. Biofeedback basically gives you information on your physiological processes. It gives you information depending on you know, how you use it. It can give you information on your temperature, on your heart rate, on your um, respiration, all these different things that you would get feedback on, hence the name. And then you can try and control it a little bit more so you can learn to control your physiological processes and put yourself at a nice steady state. You could also do uh, physical therapy if you find yourself that you are, you have an injury, right? Or if you're not moving enough, you can consult and get you know, physical therapy. Movement is very important. And us. Pain psychology, right? We really help with emotional regulation. It's one of our tools in our toolkit. So in summary, things that you can do are helps with your thoughts, you know, try to have a more balanced outlook of life, have a, a healthy relationship with your thoughts. Pain psychologists can help you do that. Regular psychologists can help you do that. Um, relaxation, biofeedback, physical therapy, and consult your medical provider to see what options that you have.